the one under first step. That'd that be correct. Okay. All those conditions that entertain the motion to adopt. Motion by Lou. And a second by Kellogg. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify to say aye. Aye. Thank you both same sign. Motion carries. District 741 is proud of Rachel McLeod, grade 12, from the fourth place medal in the round at the, state, at the Class A State Speech Meet. She is the first Gainesville High School student to place twice at the State Speech Meet. Brittany Hutch, grade 12, has earned the state degree, which is the FFA chapter's highest rank. Matthew Quay, grade 10, West Central Conference Honorable Mention to Boys Basketball for the 12-13 season. Andrew Topp, grade 11, all section boys basketball team. 2013. Erica Schlagen, grade 12, and Kayla Schaefer, grade 10, West Central Conference, all conference, real basketball for the 12 13 season. Brooke Wirtz, grade 12, West Central Conference, honorable mention in girls basketball for the 12 13 season, all section girls basketball team 2013. Caitlin Morozik, grade 10, and Heather Arnold, grade 10, uh, West Central Conference, all conference in gymnastics for the 12 13 season. Kayla Burris, grade 12, and Tanner Harder, grade 12, West Central Conference, all conference and wrestling from 12 13 season. Derek Ludwig, grade 11, WCC honorable mention in wrestling for the 12 13 season. <coughs> okay, for uh, congratulations to the FFA members on a job well done this year. FFA state convention results are as follows Job interview individual, Brittany Uch, 12th grade, placed fifth. Prepared public speaking individual, Sabrina Leg, 12th grade, placed 11. The dairy judging team placed 14. Team members were John Frenchick, 12th grade, Kyle Willenbring, 10th grade, Tyler Eblen, 12th grade, and Anthony Whitman, 10th grade. Best informed Greenham team uh, won, placed 14. Excuse me. Best informed Greenham team won, placed 14. Team members were 9th grader Mercedes Holmquist. Sawyer Eblen, Dalton Fluga, Andrew Lenzmeyer, and Corey Dalton. Ag Mechanics team placed 16th. Team members were Andrew Lenzmeyer, 9th grade, Brad Roach, 10th grade, John Schaefer, 10th grade, and Corey Dalton, 9th grade. Best informed Greenham team 2 placed 17th. Team members were 9th graders Kelly Raymer, Jessica Walls, Peter Walls, Allison Nelson, and Ryan Lee. Livestock judging team placed 26th. Team members were Hope Walls, 12th grade, Taylor House, 11th grade, Kelly Raymer, 9th grade, and Peter Walls, 9th grade. Floor culture team placed 27th. Team members were Tyler Volunteer, 11th grade, Abigail Cash, 12th grade, Brittany Butch, 12th grade, and Mercedes Holmquist, 9th grade. Small animal team placed 33rd. Team members were Allison Nelson, 9th grade, Rachel Ampey, 12th grade, Ryan Lee, 9th grade, and Jessica Walls, 12th grade. And Gary Hamlin, individual, Sawyer Evelyn, 9th grade, her 39th place. So, on to business, number one. Is there anybody here in public comment? And then uh, why don't we move on to Hoover, correct minutes from the last board meeting of the 23rd. Okay, motion by Bruce to approve it, and second by Cheryl. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, we have no items under the consent agenda. We have uh, covered Number one under business, we have number four under business. We're going to go out of order. We've got Kyle Simonson here from Albert Engineering. And he's going to kind of review the facility information from uh, two summers ago. So, Kyle, thanks for coming. Yeah. We'll see you guys again. I do want to thank Kyle because uh, you know that he's, he's had a busy schedule and he managed to work us into it. So, we very much appreciate that.
I'm Kyle Simonson, a couple of new board members from last time um, with Hallberg Engineering. And we, we sat with the uh, facilities committee meeting, several meetings, and basically what we did is we went through each facility. These sheets here. These basically, these basically are sheets for your reference stating of just the facts. That's the systems and the buildings they, where they currently are and what's in them and a real rough overview of how they work. Um, it has no recommendations or new systems or any proposed systems on there. Um, through our meetings with the committee, um, we determined really, in our opinion, We've got nothing but time to plan. There's, no, there's really no sense of urgency of any issues. Um, all in all, basically, the systems are they're in, they're working, they're just old or with their age. And there's always some tweaks and adjustments that can be made. Um, we talked about in the for the facilities committee meeting the sheet. Um, I'll just run down what our overview was. And that was basically, we review the buildings, uh, we recommend we develop and maintain a yearly maintenance budget. That's basically taking care of items, water treatment, um, miscellaneous items or fix-it items that I would need to do. Um, item three, upgrade the DDC versus maintain the uh, current pneumatics. Uh, the, systems can the systems can be maintained. Obviously, if it's mechanical and there's moving parts, things will always move and get out of adjustment. They, they need to be, they need to be uh, set back to where they originally were intended to be. Um, with the upgrade, also, it was, really, the, it makes sense. If you're going to upgrade controls, always consider if you're going to do an infrastructure upgrade. If you replace the uh, components or air handler systems in there, that's when it would make the most sense to upgrade the DDC. If you decide to maintain those systems, then that decision would be putting new components in there. Otherwise, typically, if DDC gets put in, DDC meaning electronic controls, if you ever decide to upgrade in the near future, a lot of times that system just gets worked out and replaced. Um, and the same would go for converting to hot water from steam. Really, you're not going to see any paybacks on those systems because the first cost is pretty significant. It only makes sense if you elect and decide to do infrastructure upgrades. Do that right along with it. Um, item four, we really, our opinion was, don't do any more studies or anything. We, from the from the consensus from the, the, the meetings we had, we felt we know what we have here in the district. Is there there's really don't spend, any more, don't spend any more money doing more studies. Um, put it towards any improvements, and that would be having recommissioning done. And that's an entity coming in making readjustments, uh, doing actually measurements, and then when those measurements are made, getting the system back to where it was. And that's that's a, performed by a contractor. Um, and then if you are going to do any studies, basically it's if that's what the district feels it needs or desires to communicate that to the public. That's, that's the type of study. And then the, the, when you do do a study, that really can be tailored to anything you want. How, how do you want that study? What do you want that for, to uh, uh, transmit in data to the public? Item five, recalibrating work at the elementary building for the upcoming school year. That is, again, going back and readjusting, uh, setting things back where they were originally were. It'll do nothing but improve the environment. Um, that means physically going around making adjustments. Um, it will have value, basically, because that money spent will make an improvement. Um, that any any uh, money spent on that, if you were to do an upgrade or a change out of system, you can't carry that money over. Obviously, that money is put into the existing system, so it's going to have to be thrown out if that system is replaced. And then lastly, um, if you're going to engage or hire an owner's consultant, um, that would assist in administer, administering the overall work, regardless of the scope of budget. 
really, it's, it's up to the district if you need a construction manager to help you plan. That basically facilitate planning or deciding and getting towards what does the district really need or want to do. And then if you do hire that consultant, basically um, that entity really needs to be what the district can trust or be familiar with. That's an overview of our numerous meetings with the facilities committee. Um, and then on July 19th, basically our update to the school board, which is the other sheet, is we ran through the meetings, and you'll see on there itemized, those are, that's the frequency of each meeting, and pretty detailed discussions we got into regarding the systems. Um, and really, this, this document then is tied to these recommendations. So I'm going to assist for establishing a goal or direction that the district wishes to proceed. It's going from memory. <laughs> now, can you explain how did, how did you come up with your recommendations? Did you want to do the buildings? Did you check the systems? What exactly did you do to come up with the recommendations? We walked through the building. Uh, let's see. Let me back up. We first came out, had a couple meetings with Donnie and the systems, got familiar with them. We looked at the uh, existing plans, reviewed the plans, and considered the design. How are the systems designed? CFMs, air rate changeover. Um, we had several site visits reviewing and, and confirming are the systems pretty much installed the way the plans indicate. What we didn't do, we didn't go around with hoods measuring, we didn't go around taking temperatures, we didn't go around with instruments taking readings um, to determine, and, and really, that's a method you can do. You can go take readings, or you can look on existing plans and determine, are the systems, um, are they up to current code? Are they out of calibration? What are their rates? Um, and how do they compare to current conditions? One other question, I do apologize for it. I just, one other, if you recommission a building, do they do that then? So they, because I'm assuming a recommissioning would make everything get is as good as it can, based on the systems that we have, to try to bring it to where it was when it was new. Correct. A re recommissioning would be going around and measuring, and so they would measure, they would adjust, and then they would measure the results. They would measure the results, quantify it. You end up with a book with a whole bunch of data that thick with numbers. Um, and typically with recommissioning, I think of there's got to be some energy savings attached with that to do that, to help have that somewhat assisted or funded by a utility. I can't remember who the utility company is, but that, <coughs> that, that would be a recommissioning. Rock, walking around and not assessing the systems, but basically taking measurements and that user is getting X amount of CFM. What's the plan say? It's deficient by X amount. Okay, so they would give us the results and explain what those results mm -hmm. mean then. Correct. Because I have no doubt you could give me the book and have me try to explain it and all it looks like is numbers. Correct. That would not get it adjusted though. The recommissioning study will tell you if it's deficient or not, but the study, the recommissioning study itself, won't actually have the contractor go in and make that adjustment and get everything fixed back to that market. It's just a study. So they just market. check to see what how your system is running then? Correct. Then you come up with budgeting and determine you know, what contractors would be needed to come in and actually make the adjustments to get it back to its performance. What would that cost to recommission buildings? Uh, that, would, that would vary based upon um, firms that would be pricing it up, but I would guess um, for a We'll say for this facility, that could cost maybe about a hundred thousand dollars for the middle school and high school. Middle school, high school. And one of the things that we'll get more of that information to the board is next week. We do have Yule coming out, which it works in conjunction with Excel, because Excel has a number of rebates that you can um, go for to do that type of thing. And they will be here, and they will be able to answer all of those questions for the board next week. Have a crack on that, Donnie? Yep, here. Yeah. <coughs> because at least they're suggesting we can do it for considerably less than that, but I, I don't want to speak for that. 
And I think that what would be important is, does, would that include measuring and adjustment yes. or just a study? Yeah, but I think that's certainly a question that we need to ask. That's why we invited them here to be able to answer those types of questions. So back to what you did two years ago, recommissioning is just uh, more thorough. I mean, is that right? I mean, you looked at the systems and had enough knowledge, but without actually testing it, you gave recommendations. Having the test would, would they they'd either support those recommendations or not, right? Right. Okay. Right. So you go through this recommissioning. Um, how do we keep track of that? You know, it seems to me that um, it's recommissioned, everything's supposed to be working out is, but that is still going to hear from certain areas that might not be appropriate, all of that. And that, in the grand scale, is your analysis to potentially look at something else. Um, my impression so far is recommissioning tells us where we're at. Then if there's issues we have to resolve, how, how do schools monitor that? Is there formats that Donnie would use um, or some method of tracking for the next year or two? It's all done, it's all set, but where are the problems that exist? And if they're, if they're there, and then you can move forward with it. Because it looks to me like if you tore it all apart, and you start all brand new, you could get all done and still have some of the same problems that you had when you started at the beginning. So you didn't resolve them. Is this making sense? You could create new ones too. By yeah, way, yeah. The idea of a brand new system being fail-safe is probably slim to none. It's going to have a lot of problems. May not. May have a larger budget to maintain than we have right now. But if you're going to, do something, <coughs> how do you? How do schools do that? Do they have charts where Donnie maybe starts keeping track of temperatures in the room? I know that you had a discussion one time at these meetings where we talked about. One of the biggest point complaints being stuffy. And then you talked about the definition of stuffy. Mm -hmm. Definition of stuffy, nobody could really define that. Um, you said that that could be temperature all by itself, being too high. So do you see what I'm saying? Is there um, a set of stuff we could give somebody like Donnie who's supposed to track this thing? Or do we do something in analysis to make sure that we're finding if there's, if there are issues and where they may be. I think, I haven't really seen a detailed reporting system really mm -hmm. from any district, and I'm sure every district would be unique in how they report that. I think it would be notes, and I think if I remember right, I had notes from just issues in the past, mm -hmm. a room number and those past complaints. And right now, basically, our baseline is where we're at right now and the frequency of complaints that you're getting, maybe none, maybe some, and then after the recommissioning, how has that changed from those rooms? And that will kind of help all isolate what the issues are. Um, also, I think it's educating the staff in the building of we're gonna go through and be doing this process. We're probably gonna be running into new issues, comfort, temperature, any issues like that raise that awareness to the staff of what's going on and then they would help report that. I don't know if I would go through an email process, maybe report it on paper, because I think if you do it in an email process, you might have a resilient of um, And it would kind of help monitor that and keep that real of the issues that are going on. That would, that's, those are some just, and it comes down to the building, the building operators or the engineers basically the ones who are in that building because if you've got a roaming buildings and grounds guy or somebody spread over I think that could be somewhat overwhelming of keeping track of that input coming back of what are the issues going on that's just a thought of that so if you just narrow it down and you just start keeping track of temperature will you probably grasp a fair amount of what's going on like say um, you know what the temperature is three times a day, and all of a sudden there's a room where the complaints are coming from, and they're always 75 degrees. But the instructor, who's the staff, has been working in that for the last 10 years, and they're not even going to know it. Mm -hmm. and if you right. see what I'm saying? I think attached to what's going on outside, basically the, the weather conditions, because that'll tell you 
Is it heating or is it some ventilation or some other issue going on? So what's the weather like on some solar beam? Is that coming in the building? Are they shutting the lines? Thing, things like that that will help you know, bring that, bring that to the surface of what is the real issue going on in this room? But Kyle, also part of that is too that I know working at a larger facility in town here myself that until somebody was able to grasp what is actually happening with those things up there, is there a motor out, is there the dampers closed, or whatever, and, and without you physically going in there and actually examining it, you don't know what's happening with that, because if it's all mechanical, okay? Right. If you have pneumatics on there where you're actually able to see the flows and the, and the you know, intake of air, cold and the cold deck to hot deck or whatever, however that room operates, then you're able to isolate is there, what's going on in that room. Because any given day, one day I might feel hotter than heck just because of what I, activities that I was doing. Now the room is stuffy and hot to me. The next day, if I'm chilled or whatever because I was outside all morning, I come into the room, now I feel chilled. The temperature is probably the same, but you're still getting those complaints. Without running to each room like Rodani would have to do in the situation that we're having right now and checking it physically, there's no one person or even a, a crew of people that can keep that information straight without having some concrete information of what's actually, by looking at something on a computer that you can actually see what's going on. And that I think is the dilemma in two big buildings like we have where we have one day that if there's a bell that's stuck open just for that day, even I mean you can you can have for hours from hour to hour that might be sticking or then all of a sudden it works its way loose and then it flying again. So but Donnie one or any of his guys that work for him wouldn't have no clue. But here you get a flood of paper right. requests saying, Oh my room is hot and stuffy. Well what's going on with my room? Well, as him and, and to his defense, where do you start? I mean you don't have anything to bank it on or to to put it on because you can't go back to a computer, you can't go back to somewhere and say this is what the settings were. And they are working, I can see them working. Because we run into the daily basis, you know, where we feel that patients are worn in a particular room, we call up maintenance, what's going on in this room? You're fine, it's, everything is going to what you had set parameters at. And it is what it is for that day. At least you're not chasing your tail to try to figure out what is going on. Sure, sure, and that, and that helps. Um, from the let's say let's say a report would a report should bring out an item with like these this this building has a dual duct box and you're right this, let's say this room gets reported to be hot where do you start is it the thermostat is it the maybe it's the sensor buried up in the air monitoring station right up in the dual duct box and you're creating the damper to stay shut right and it could take you two days to get down to that one hundred dollar floor right. sensor right that issue. <coughs> And those are the dilemmas that we're having with <coughs> every system in here, whether it's a unit ventilator, if it's a, a one that's on the roof, or whatever, it's just a matter of where do you even start? And we don't have the manpower to, or the women power, to go through this building and, and, and check it all out. So again, now that's where we need to start focusing on how are we going to do that, and how we're going to Recommissioning the building to figure out where we're sitting at, I think is probably a great idea. But my, my first question is how much money is going to cost? We don't have much for capital expenditures. And how do we get to that point then? Once we find it, the solution or the, the problem, how do we fix it, fix it so that two days later it's, you don't know where what's going on in that room because you're right back to the square root of, you have no idea unless if you have some sensors in there to determine what's going on. Right. So will, the, will the electronic system give all the information that Mark is talking about then? Would you be able to determine based on an electronic system all those pieces? You could. Depends. It's point. Basically a point. Each each monitoring area is called a point. So you have a dual duct box which serves this building. You can have up to eight points and that could be per box $8,000. So in order to get you there, but again, yeah, but but right. that's but but it could do that. That's right. as a, as a, um, I think if I remember right, <coughs> these boxes were currently retrofitted or something with pneumatics, and I would I would question you know through the as things are brought to life, 
I think you will admit it would be what would it take to get that box up and running? You know, like you're, you're saying, things like that. But, yeah. but a computer system will tell you all that. And if you go that way, then does that force you to then do other adjustments to the whole system itself? Or can you just add the electronic pieces to the system you have? Or does that force you to take it all out and, and replace it? Depends how it's set up, but it, it has that ability. You could add to it. The thing is, you could put in a you could put in a monitoring system. And the question would always be: you put in a computer uh, at the front end. How much do you monitor? Because again, it comes down to those points or those that information coming back to it is what's going to be the big capital expense out here. Because that system would say would read uh, the air handler serving this wing is. On. Well, it's the cheapest. On off. Mm -hmm. tell you it's on off. But it doesn't right. tell you a whole lot about what the problem could be. Yep. But then you can at least isolate it to that particular area and then fix it. Because I know even at where I work, they did it in sections. You don't have to do the entire whole building or all the buildings into one. You can say, okay, we're going to check. We're going to what is our most problematical area and determine, okay, this is what it is. Let's let's slowly but surely keep on adding to it as we go um, because otherwise we're going to be right back where we were two years ago with that uh, 16 28 million dollar renovation <coughs> and just ventilation I had a, uh, a question just kind of get your recollection because at some point we discussed two years ago recommissioning and we decided not to do it and yet we came out with roughly eight million dollars worth of recommendations right so, yeah. So, what, what I mean, why did we decide not to recommission at the time? Was it the cost? It, it, was it you know, partially through the confidence that you had in, in examining these systems? I'm trying to recollect how we got to this point without the recommission. We, at some point, made a determination that you know, these systems needed to be upgraded. Um, what was that? Was that simply based on? What Johnson Controls did, what your own observations were. I mean, the recommissioning to me appears to be a step higher than what we've done. Yet we decided not to do that because it seemed clear at the time that there were needs. And I don't know if you could just kind of recollect that. Maybe you can't. I don't. I don't know if there was money set aside even to do it at that time. We decided not to. There was no money. The biggest. The biggest thing no I <laughs> was that there was. That each building was going to cost us around forty thousand dollars to recommission, and so we have three buildings, which would be a hundred and you know twenty thousand dollars, something like that. And where do we get a hundred and twenty thousand dollars in our budget? We didn't have it. It seems like if we're going to recommission, the results were going to be the same right after the project anyway. Right. So we decided to skip that step. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Basically, but that was based on your recommendations, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. And just by your, your experience and observations and looking at the systems. Is that correct? Correct. The main driver was, I think, money wasn't set aside for it, it wasn't in the budget. We can afford to delay that one more year or not do that right now. Um, just popped in my head too for, I think it's once every five years you can have recommissioning or rebalancing under health and safety. Can't replace systems. It's rebalancing the existing system of what you got. So that's if you're looking at the budget, consider that as well. We have Donnie, has that ever been done? Here? No, no. No. Well, no. I went through when they built the auditorium. I had a question. I don't chase technology just like these guys chase it for the students and they are not free so the amount you have to pay to pay the system 
all of that could potentially dwarf what we already paid for some of the maintenance. So we need to be a little careful. It's really kind of an interesting idea. But the medic system has a history here of working for a fair amount of time. It's been there for a long time. Um, industry still uses a lot of pneumatics, especially where they don't want to do the maintenance. So um, I'm a little on the other side of that part of it. The analysis and all that is great, but just like you just said, it's where your monitors are and all the rest of that stuff. Where we're at is a nominal budget, potentially looking at recommissioning with um, uh, some help from the um, Excel and looking at the system when we get back. Um, the analysis thereafter, to me, is as important as the recommissioning. There could be not a whole lot of problems going on here once that's all in place. I know when you were here last time, you brought up the gymnasium, and um, there was some discussion about how the air would all the way flow through that, and that's when recommissioning came again. So um, it would seem to me that, and part of my question was, is to monitor, how does Donnie monitor going forward? Not that you run around with a, a, a code thing every day or that kind of stuff, but after you're recommissioned, how do you really analyze if everything's fine? If you don't, if the system's not in place, it's tough. It, other than you're, you buy a handheld device, you walk around with it. Mm -hmm. And at random, you go take measurements. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the system's not there. Or do you, a lot of this based upon whether you have a new system or you have this system, based upon the complaints coming in, based upon a complaint, do you then go analyze to see where those are at? Is that maybe the system lots used? Right now. Mm -hmm. Seeing a complaint might be, boy, it's hot in this room, or my, my thermostat's not working or responding to the system. That's anywhere from it's a problem with the thermostat. Right. A damper, or maybe the copy machine sitting around there in the thermostat. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, it's internet of what you're going to find out there. Right. In the case of the, <coughs> the unit vents, all depends on where you're sitting in the room. And the type of day. What's, yeah. what's the weather outside? Mm -hmm. Is the sun shining in that window? Yep. Mm -hmm. Could conceivably the pneumatic, the pneumatic system in place to have the sensors to give you an electronic version of what's going on? You could. You could. Yeah, whether that's the most cost effective or whatever, I, I have no idea. But. And depending upon the pneumatic system, I don't know if the compressor is going to put, you're pushing hot foil out into the, out into the line. Oh, or, but if it's, if it's in okay shape, but those air compressors are going to run. Those so operators are going to They'll last a long time, they're robust. Hospitals use them because they're analog, they're not digital control, so you get into control on them. So they have monitoring, electronic monitoring of the temp, but the actual damper of the valve operator is driven through air. So it comes down to, yeah, there's oil in the lines and all that, then it's tough if you're having problems, but it's all in good shape. <laughs> Going on right now. No issues today. Nobody sent me any emails today. Boilers are off. Boilers yeah. are off. Boilers are off. How about the spinner? Are we inundated with problems all over the place? Um, we, had a few, we had a few issues while well, the day of prom for whatever reason. The, I called Donnie twice. Um, our cafeteria was really, really hot, but we couldn't figure out really why. So something. I mean, and the gym was cold, and you know, I mean, it was just that area of something was going on. But no problem before or after. But how about continuing? Is there something um, continuing like this wing over here continues to get froze up, you know, and then Donnie has to go. I mean, the it's the dampers or the valves. There is no consistency to this high school. Um, you know, Some days you walk in, it'd be nice. The next day, it'd be cold. Cool dust. That's it was cool better. Yeah. It was it was better this year because we did spend some dollars and we did re did we re we did something. We worked on we worked on a few of them and so 
that we did have as many occasions that we were starting the day below 60 degrees. I mean, these are the rooms that get hit for the most part that we were significantly two years ago. There were several rooms starting below 60 degrees in the morning until Bonnie could get around. But we did do some work on them. And this year was better. I mean, in the kids' set this year, it was better. We had some instances, though. I, I got to say, all in all, this year was better than it was. the last two years. Yes. Well, we have a, had a really cold year. We've had a lot of temperature changes. Mm -hmm. um, the cold never went away. Snow didn't either. But, <laughs> but um, I would think yeah, that if they had a huge, if this is the issue, is this something that recommissioning could figure out? Um, maybe. Uh, on those dampers, it's, I can tell you on the dual duct box that, that the nature of the system is it's constant volume. Air is going to get pumped in there at a constant volume. <coughs> and it's, there's two ducts. One's a hot duct, one's a cold. There's a damper that's going to modulate. Because of the nature of that piece, because the, the dampers are going to move and it's not a valve right at the, right at the room, a heating valve, that's why you feel that come. It's like a gas heat exchange system. It's on, off. So you can, you can rebalance it, it'll probably improve it, but you may still have that feeling that's there because there's a lot of air moving in it. And that's just that. That's so technically, it. that feeling should have been there from um, the beginning of the building. 1969. And I went to school here. Um, maybe I missed the, but I don't recall any of that. We were a lot tougher back <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but, and you know what? And that brings up a whole discussion. You bet that it was different back then. I remember growing up in, in, when I was younger, and I'm 50 years old too, so I've been in the same boat. We didn't have air conditioning in our house. We went home and we sweated it out, and so on and so forth. How many families don't have air conditioning now in their houses? And that is where the dilemma comes into play: is what is our kids experiencing now because if they're able to go home in a nice air condition and do their homework and stuff they're comfortable they sit in a classroom where it's yucky stuffy sticky they're not going to they yes they're going to notice it expectation yeah we never did i did that especially like you can remember too back when we were in school we didn't have that because hey we were conditioned to that we didn't have air conditioning at home this day and age you even for cars i don't think you buy a car without air conditioning probably Back in the 60s and 70s, there was lots of cars without air conditioning. You just sweated it out. With this day and age, they rolled it out. for a long time. Yeah. But again, that's the problem with this generation now. And even us as workers, I work in the health profession. And boy, if it's sticky, I'm miserable. <laughs> I don't, you know, yeah, I'm, hey, spoil whatever. That's society. You go into these big grocery stores and everything. They're very, very, very climate controlled. They want you comfortable. They don't want you sticky. They don't want you anything. And those are the those are the dilemmas that we're running into in this generation. Whether we like it or not, that's what it is. What we're seeing out there for schools and the drills now are cooling. Mm -hmm. Cooling is just it's a, it's a yeah. new school. It's a crisis. I mean, it, it is a crisis when the air conditioning is not working, and it's, it's surprising how. Um, let's see, over the 20, 24 and a half years I've been doing this now, heating was, you know, oh, you know, we can't freeze the building up. Heating's a detail. It's, if the chiller's not fired up or if we don't have cooling on that day, the world's going to end. So, the sidebar is, again, Mark, that's, you're, we're just seeing that with temps inside that. It's, it's, a, it's changed in the last like, some years. So people are sensitive to that. So, you're saying recommissioning may or may not work here, but for most of the rest of it, the commissioning will tell us if it's working or not. Is that kind of yeah? If you, if you have it, if you have it recommissioned and it gets with the recommissioning, I would say it, it's rebalanced. It'll help create a new baseline for you, a new baseline of where are we at, what's what's working, what's not. It'll bring out that this actuator is bad, this sensor over here is not functioning to make that damper move. It'll it'll bring that to the surface, and where that would have the value is. As they as they've identified that problem, get it replaced right there with that contractor taking that measurement, as opposed to again a study. Then somebody else has to come back and find out where that sensor is. And 
again, I think that depending upon when uh, I think you or somebody's coming in to talk is, yeah. I would I would still look at possibly seeing how that could be funded because uh, I'm not sure if they're looking into that. Well, the, the grants look like it could fund 75 percent of it. Okay. I want to hear that all with their malls in front of the board. That would certainly help us, but I think the other big question that I'm hearing is not only will they, they check things, will they adjust them to be at peak performance? Because to me, they both go hand in hand. It makes no sense to me to check to see where we're at without getting it to where it needs to be in the first place. So I, I think we need to have that discussion with them on what will that recommissioning get us? If we do this, where will we be? If all they're going to do is come around and I hate, hate to be that simplistic, but put the paper up against the vent and see if, you know, <laughs> what's, what's blowing out of there, then that doesn't do us any good without saying, well, let's adjust it up there right. and then test it. Because if you don't adjust things first and then test, I, I think we step backwards. We don't go forwards. Right. Because in the end, we need to know, if we go down that road, we need to know in the end what really needs to be done. And, and where we need to go with it. And, and all of these are, are legitimate reasons. I think we've got to have that conversation with the public because <laughs> if we get efficiency out of having an electron, electronic system, that's great. You know, it, it helps all of our maintenance people make sure and be able to fix it and adjust it and know where the problem is. You know, if that's not going to be good enough, and then it's a whole system, that's a whole new ballgame. But even a brand new system may not necessarily fix every little glitch that's there. You know, that's part of the problem. When you have big buildings, particularly ones that are put together on, you know, in sections, I've never seen one work 100% efficiency in any building I've ever been in. So to me, it's really about where do we get the best bang for the buck? And, and having that conversation with the public on, this is why we need to do what, what we're recommending that we do. Um, what would the, the quite, I think the question would be, what's the price for the recommissioning, the measuring process, to, to get the system readjusted right then and there, and then have a contingency set aside, because they're going to find components and parts that aren't working, so set aside, and you can get their help, of a limit of what are the parts that are going to be needed. Maybe it's $5,000 in parts, but minimize your surprises once they're involved with that. Because we're, we're no different than you were a number of years ago. You know, we're working at, at, on our capital budget right now, <laughs> trying to figure out how we can cut out $87,000 off, of off of things that we really need to get done right now. And we, and we don't have the dollars for it. And, and I think that's a whole new discussion with, there are ways, you know, I think we have to have that discussion with the community about the fact our roofs are leaking. The fact our parking lots, you can, you, at least at one point until we filled it with dirt, you might have lost a car. You know, um, we've, we've got to have those discussions with the public because that all mixes into this whole thing too, in my opinion, because if we don't mix that in and we go to the community for a facility project, we'll never have enough money when we're trying to fix the everyday things because, you know, we, we've got to get the roads fixed. You know, we've got our parking lots. We've got to get the roofs fixed. That takes the vast majority of the capital things that we have right now. There's nothing left over to, to maintain and to keep the systems running the way they need to. Any other questions for Carl? I certainly don't want to keep him here. He was very generous to come today. I'd like to throw out there, of if, if Yule, I've worked with Yule a lot, if they throw out a proposal, I'd be willing to look at it and offer input to make sure that, that try to minimize the surprise, you know, what are they, and that way you get the, you get the most bang for your buck of what they're going to do the work. I mean, you don't want just a book with a whole bunch of numbers because then what do you do with it? You, want it you, know, you basically you, want stuff fixed. Because my concern is Yule is coming out, but we could convince Excel Energy to come out. So I'm a little worried about making sure that both hands know exactly what the other one is going to do. So I think that would certainly be a great idea. If, if you'd be willing to do that, that'd be fantastic. And I think they're gonna, the utility company's going to want to review 
their the proposal the that you will make. And that may take six months because we're doing one for Hennepin County now where it took, I think it took Excel six months to get back to the owner and tell them how much they're going to fund. But ultimately, you, the owner always has to have it. You need to make that first payment, then you get your check back for the utility company. So it's real money that you're going to have to pay have up front. To have it up front. Okay, anything else? Thanks, Kyle. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, Thank you. We can always another lunch, though. McDonald's is opening. That's yeah. <laughs> good. Kyle, thank you. Really no appreciate it. Appreciate it. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. I think we're on number two. Uh, We'll have a discussion about possible reductions coming up. Readjust here. Uh, in your packets, I gave you a, a couple of sheets. One looked like this, and, and this is just kind of our classes and the numbers that are kind of registered for those classes. All right. On the far right side, it really gives you those are the classes kind of in that grade area that are classes that we have reduced already, at least at this point, just because of lack of numbers. So if we take a look at the first one, um, exercise and self-defense, one and two, there were 15 kids that were rec or were in, in that class. You see where I'm at? On the far right hand side up at the top. Okay? So it, it kind of gives you an idea when you look at intro business, there were two people that registered for that class. Okay, the management, uh, manage a business, one person. Those are the reasons that we're recommending that at least at this time, we don't have those classes offered. If you're going to have, offer one class that has two students, that's going to be an expensive class for, for the board. All right? Um, when, I, when we look at these, uh, and I know that uh, we had a little bit of discussion, um, or I've talked to a few board members. In the past, you haven't gotten this much detail. All right, I think administration has just come to you and said, we want, these are the savings, we want to cut this much amount. I think a couple things. Number one, it's good for you to hear it. But just as importantly, I think it's good for the community to hear why and what we do in order to come up with the recommendations that we come up with. So whether we continue to give you this much detail will be up to the board. But I do think it's a good starting point and I do think it's a good thing for the community to hear and understand why we're looking at what we're doing. This is really the, the first step. I kind of talked about it at the last board meeting. Um, I got some bad news today you know, that I mentioned to a couple board members as, as they came in. We're going to be over budgeted by $100,000 of special ed. All right? Now, there's a few reasons why that's happened. We lost some students that were open enrolled outside of the district and came to us. And really, it's the, when that happens, you collect money from other districts. All right, well, we lost some students, so we're not collecting as much as we thought. Minnesota sent us, they don't send us a bill, but they withhold $8,000 for last year. All right, so last time I talked to the board, we were looking at, I told you, 100, originally it was 135, I said it'd probably be 150 to 200,000 deficit spend. Now, because of the 100,000, we're at more like 167,000 or $267,000 worth of deficit spend. So originally, we really weren't looking at reducing our budgets in the buildings, those types of things. Now I'm going to have to go back and I'm going to have to revisit that. What I'm going to talk about is not what I would call cuts, but efficiency and programming for students. I don't have another word for it other than reducing. You can call it just not offering because of low enrollment. It's about talking about possibly, well, we can't offer everything every year. Possibly we offer some things every other year. But it does have a real impact on budget, and it does have a real impact, impact in some cases on staff, which makes it even more difficult. In this case, as I go down through this, you'll find out that it has an impact on really two, two of our staff members the most, because Although this is the first step, if we're going to put somebody on on request to leave, even reduce their amount, we have to make a proposal and then we have to get 14 days for it, them to request a hearing, and then we have to finalize the proposal. So what you will hear is 
suggestions on and my recommendations on what we could look for budget reduction. Then next meeting we'll need to make the proposal. You'll have to approve it. That gives the staff members a chance for a hearing and then we have to finalize if we're going to go that way. All right. So we're going to kind of talk, but does everybody kind of have an understanding of this sheet then and how, how it's working? So there, on the far right are really classes that we're not recommending that we, we go with this year. The darker classes uh, in, the, in the main white piece are really college offering courses. And, and I'll send you this in color because it's a lot easier. Um, like macroeconomics, those are courses that you can get, our kids can get college credits for. If I'm not mistaken, right. Right. Yeah, the, the red bolded area uh, or your shaded area yeah. are concurrent enrollment classes, two year and four year. The ones that have the stars by them or the asterisk, like stats, macroeconomics, honors, those are the four year college concurrent courses, just to kind of give you a visual. So when you're looking at course um, suggestions, you kind of know where we're looking. I mean, yeah, and when we get to the high school, areas. yeah, when we get to the high school piece, we did try not to hit any one area severely to keep the, the impact on. Let's talk about the elementary school first. Take a look. You got this sheet in your packet, all right? And then it's just a staffing sheet. It shows the the teachers. A couple of things on where they will be reducing in the elementary school is that some. Well, when the teacher retires, quite frankly, they're usually at the top of our pay scale. And we don't hire typically, nor would I recommend that we hire somebody at the same exact level. They get, they make less money. So you get a cost savings typically with this. In the case of Pam Pfeiffer, she's retiring, um, but she's also a special ed teacher. And I think for some of you, I sent a number out, it was higher. It does, it's not as much because she's special ed and we get some of that money back from the state. All right. So, there, but there's still a forty thousand dollars savings there. If we don't replace her, which we're not intending to do, because right now our special ed numbers are down, and we don't need to replace that staff member. In fact, one of the one of the the savings will be that because our 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 numbers are down in special ed, it's probably going to affect one pair or two, which would be the other savings number that we have down there about eighteen thousand dollars. Almost nineteen thousand that we will save if if it, our numbers stay where they're at. Now, I've been around a long time. I've seen five to ten students that have special needs come into a district over a summer. You don't know that, but at least for now, our numbers warrant realigning between the high school and the and the elementary. As far as our special ed staff, looking at where the needs are and making sure that everything's covered without being overstaffed. And doing whatever reduction. So our recommendation isn't to come back and, and replace Pam. All right, now that's a savings. Now on the other side, there's a couple things that Dave, if you correct me wrong, would really like. We do need some more help in adaptive PE, and that's at almost about that $7,000, all right? And he would certainly love to have back a, a teacher who works with Title um, I kids, our most needy kids, in the math in, in area. Our current one serves a lot, a lot of kids. By having another teacher it would allow, enable us to double that number. But if you do that, then any savings that we just got from the retirement of the teacher is gone. In fact, we'll have spent some. And we, we certainly won't add anything, but we won't save as much dollars. You'll save 18,000 um, and then you'll add 40, you know, 47 and you'll save the 40,000. So you can see it's a give and take on that, all right? At this point, and I talked with Dave, I'm going to recommend to the board that we just don't hire anybody else at this point until we get this budget. I don't want any more surprises before I'm willing to say we can go down the road of hiring another Title I teacher. Now, I may come back to the board and say, you know, it didn't turn out as bad as we thought. This would really be beneficial. So I want the board to understand, though, even though I'm recommending that we just wait right now, I may come back and say, it, it's not as tough. You know, part of what I've always told the board is that this is still an area I'm growing every day in. Next year when we have this discussion, it will be a much better discussion because I'll know the budget much more thoroughly than I do right now. But for now, I'm not going to recommend that. I am going to recommend that we have the adaptive PE because those special ed students do need that. Those are kids who need that time. 
And then I'm going to recommend that we wait on bringing back the other one. Now, there is one other option in there. This year, down at the bottom is $62,000 in literacy dollars. I believe we're going to get that again. Nobody has told me that that's going to be cut. Those are dollars that we primarily use for a lot of curriculum this year at the elementary. All right? He's bought the curriculum. He's pretty well set up now at the elementary. There's two things you could do with that. One is that you could use that money to pay for other staff members. There's not a lot of restrictions to those dollars, you understand? By doing that, in essence, you would save $62,000. <coughs> See how that works? We just pay using that money rather than buying curriculum to pay for a staff member. Now, I wouldn't recommend all that. I think there's still some needs that we need to continue to work with at the elementary school, but those dollars are there. You can also use those dollars to, quite frankly, pay for the Title I teacher. All right? So those are a couple options that we'll talk about in, in Solidify next week. But So right now, if we did not replace, you'd save the $40,000. You'd pay the $7,000. You'd save approximately $19,000 for the para if the numbers weren't that we don't need as many paras. And you could save the $62,000 and use that to pay for other staff. Those are the savings right now that we've come up with with the elementary school. All right. Like I said, Dave will tell you, and, and you know, his concern is working with the teachers and meeting the needs of the kids. He would tell you that he would like to have that title one. I, don't, I, I can't emphasize that enough to you. Is that good enough, Dave? Did I get it hit well, or you want to well, say something there? <laughs> my my concern is that um, last year when we had four retirements, I was only able to replace three, and our title one program uh, we have 92. 92 students who did not receive Title I services because we only had one teacher, one Title I teacher. And my thought is this, the, liter the K-3 literacy money that we get is based on how well our students do because how well they do determines how much money we get. To me, that money is not part of the general fund. We got it last year. The money is not part of the general fund. And if we can use uh, some of our savings from the retirement and some of that literacy money and have two title teachers, we would be able to service all of our students. We say we want to, we need to service all of our special ed students, which we do, but we also have uh, our Title I students and we are a focused school and the whole premise of improving and closing the achievement gap and if we can't service the, the very students that count against us in our achievement gap, then we're, we're treading water and I just can't do that anymore. We have 92 kids that did not receive services this year that qualify for it, but I've got one Title I teacher servicing 71 kids at a time and it's just, it's an impossible job at this point. So my, my, and Bob hears it from me every day, every day I'm talking to him about it, but <coughs> he does it on purpose. So that literacy money is, is money that is not part of the general fund. It's, it's, a, it's money that, that was new last year, and we were fortunate enough to use uh, about $40,000 of that on curriculum. We're, we don't have that need this year, but we just definitely have a need for it. Um, replacing that title person that was lost to service those students. And it would be, to me, it would be devastating if we, if we weren't able to do that. Now, now I did want to give Dave his, his, his shot also at, at, at letting the board know that I, I will play the other side of that stick, though. Because they may not be said it goes right into the general fund, but there are no stipulations on those dollars. So they can be used as cost savings. Dave certainly has, has told you why he wants that. And, and truthfully, I can't disagree with any of the reasoning that Dave has just told you. I can only tell you that sooner or later, we are going to need to get a grip on our budget. I won't, my recommendation will still be that we wait to see how our budget is going to shake out before we add anything back. Because I would rather be on the safe side of this than on the other side of it. Now, does that mean that there's some waiting? Does that mean that we might have to bring back somebody later, which makes it tougher to hire, quite frankly, sometimes? Yeah, it does. That's a cost that we 
we would have. But at the same time, when I'm in part of it, you know, the fact that I've just been surprised with hundred thousand dollar deficit I didn't think I had. Um, that's that's part of it. Now that could change a little bit. We're still expecting some additional dollars in, but we're not going to know that until June. All right. So again, I, I'd rather err on the side of safety in this case. And it, it does get back to, again, you know, one of the things that I've consistently heard since I've been in the district is, why is that school not right on the money for their budget? Okay, and, and I talked with public about the community members, uh, about that particular piece. They're concerned that why can't we predict? Well, some things we can't predict. And one of the reasons that the school in the past, is, it, it hasn't been as bad as what, what it could have been was because they had cushions. And if you don't put cushions in there to some degree and continue to update the community on why the budget has changed, you end up with us because we don't have a lot in our reserve funds. Then you get hit with a $100,000 surprise for whatever reason. And special ed will continue to be a surprise to us every year because we can't predict the needs of our students. Right now, for instance, I believe the, the number of our students are going down. I think the needs of our students are going up. So uh, we may not be able to provide a programming here for a student. We may need to go to another program, which all costs the district additional dollars, because we don't have a program here. You can't predict those things. You simply can't. So you've got to have a cushion there that you may or may not need. And if you don't need it, hey, that's wonderful. You can say, we predicted this, but it didn't happen. So it's great, we have these dollars that are gonna move forward in, in, into our budget. If you have a big general, a, a big reserve fund, it's not as much of a concern. Because if you get a surprise, you have a general or a reserve fund to take care of those types of things. We don't have that. We, we simply don't. So, but anyway, those are the pieces. I know that Dave is, is very passionate about that. I, and again, I don't dispute his reasoning whatsoever. But right now, my concern more is the overall budget of the district to make sure we're on solid grounds. And then if we can, we can have that. That would be my recommendation. But we're going to move on. Um, I did yep. have a couple of quick sure. questions. Yep. We lost five special ed students that were open enrolled. That's, that's the number that was given me. I think it was about four. Yeah, four and then there were a couple, I think, that were seniors, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you to address the question that we asked last time. Yeah. Um, and that was about the school board budget. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that you had some concerns about the school board budget. Yeah. But they just, I, I don't have an answer to that right now. Like I said, um, I sat down today when I got this update. Okay. And haven't my had much question of a time. is, yep. um, with the Title I instructor we presently have, is it going to be I'm not real familiar with the, the licensing and whatever. Is it possible to have an assistant for that Title I? Uh, I'll give you my opinion, but then I'm going to let Dave address this, all right? Or, or is a para it, a I, you know, I have been in, in both models. Okay. Um, unless you have a very qualified and very well-trained para, in my opinion, you don't get bang for the buck. Now, Dave, I don't know if you have a different opinion well, than, than I do. In the system we're in, it's, we're a targeted school. There's targeted and there's school-wide. Targeted means that our our paraprofessionals that we pay out of title, which is only about three, can only work with Title I students. And our Title I teacher is in the same boat. Even if we have a, the paras that work with those students, they do not create lessons, they do not you know, dictate anything at all. It still needs to be teacher driven. And so those paras typically work out of the, in the classroom with the teachers and then the Title I teacher, who is a licensed teacher, is working on tier, there's three tiers of interventions that the students are working on based on based on the level of their need. And so that teacher is, is pulling those students out and working with, with those students. And so it's, uh, it's a good system. It's, it's nice to have um, licensed staff you know, the more you have, the better. But, you know, and, and to have licensed staff guide that, I think, is, is beneficial to everybody. I, th I think this, yeah, I think still the problem would be is that there's only so much time that a licensed teacher can help the parent and develop the lessons. And there's only so much money in the Title I grant. 
I have enough to pay, I pay a classroom teacher out of that for class size reduction, and I pay the title teacher and maybe three pairs, and that basically takes care of all the title, title money we get. So. In the grand scale of all this thing, uh, a topic that comes up all the time is this kindergarten program. And the state's been working on it, everybody's been working on it. We have a fear yeah. for the kindergartners. It, <coughs> this eliminates all the money for Well, the it, 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 it's a great thing for our parents. And I believe that both in the Senate and the House's budget, there is that piece that they're going to start funding. The trouble is that the state has a great way of taking from this hand and putting it over this hand without anything happening. When we made our first run with, with that, they talked about funding full-time kindergarten. The reason that we can't fund it right now is because the ratio for kindergarten students is not as high as the ratio for a senior, for instance, or for that matter, even a seventh grader. That's where the ratios kind of get to where they need to be. Their idea at the time was that a student in high school costs more because you have the advanced classes. All right? Right now, our parents pay for the all-day kindergarten. This would help them tremendously. I think it's a wonderful thing. Everybody should have, in my opinion, the opportunity to have their students go to all-day kindergarten if that's what their wish is, without it costing them anything. As far as our budget, though, it doesn't help us at all. So if the state does their thing, is that other dollars we're going to have to be concerned with here? Well, well when th there was an old fault piece in there. When we made our original runs kind of based on the changes, because they were looking at change of the ratio of kindergarten, but they were also looking at change in the ratios in other grades. And we made our run on that particular piece, and we said, how would this affect us? We actually lost $5,000 out of our budget. And that's where I talked about, well, that sounds great, but are we really getting any new money? The work that they're doing right now is the important work because both the House and the, you know, and the Senate have gotten together now, and they're in conference, and they're going to hammer out all the details. Now is really the time when those decisions are going to be made and how it will affect us. If they don't change the ratio and they just pay us for all day kindergarten, hey, that's a, that's a good thing for us. But that wasn't the last thing I had heard, but I don't know where it's at right now. You know, that'll have to be, you know, looked at. So, brings up another question. We, we talk a lot about how the kindergarten class coming in looks to be small. It, it's smaller. Yeah, not, it's like by how many? I think it was five to eight. It's hard to get a great grip. Dave, in past history, has said that we get some kids. Can happen to that has to do with that fee. No, not, not that we can tell right now. It could be just less kids with kindergarten. One demographic oriented. Yeah, it could be anything. Now, now in some hands, it, if we do get the funding from the state, it certainly could help our enrollment because there is, it's possible there are people that are going to other districts because other, other districts have paid for that. And it could entice possibly people to come back here because now we don't charge. Where you start, probably is where you're going to stay. So well, we're, we won't get them back once we start them, but where we're our family was going to say, you know, I don't want to go here because of this, it could change their mind. You're right, usually where they start, they stay. They usually go on small over, although there are some. Any other questions as far as the elementary? <coughs> Okay, then let's kind of move to the high school. And that would be the, the, just a short summary piece that I gave you, it looks like this. It just kind of talks a little bit about this philosophy again, full class sizes, that type of stuff. Um, and there are some, when you look at that, there are some smaller class sizes because they're, they're either special classes or they could be remedial classes which we've tried to keep in place and, and they're going to be smaller classes. So somebody may come to you and say, well, why did they keep that class and not this one? If you run into that type of thing, give us a call, and we'll take each individual question in as it comes. The following classes were dropped just because of low enrollment. So if you take a look at that list that they're all underlined there, that's why. The one question, the one class that, that did jump up but is not later is macro. It is a college class. There was certainly concern on the part of the instructor that you will lose kids if you don't offer it. Um, there were, and, and I'll get down to that a little bit later, so I don't want to better not jump around. But anyway, those are the classes. In Woods Week, I think we dropped one section. There were two classes of 15, but 
if you add another section, then you got three classes of 10, and where are you going to cut that off? I think we were fine with that. And the rest are just there. Anything else about that, Lori, you want to add? Um, the only thing that doesn't come up later, I, I believe, would be the art class. Um, or does that come up? I think I do have that okay. in there as far as okay, yeah, pieces. Yeah. Covered it, that okay. Way. Now, the one section of Lance Tran that we were talking about is really tied into what it does affect one instructor that we'll be talking about when I come back with the proposal on what I'd like to do. Um, Mike Gunther teaches Lance Trans, and we're looking at dropping one section. Now what that causes is that instead of class sizes 10 and less, they run up to, uh, the, probably the easiest description would be 10 to 15. The other piece with this is, is that he certainly has concerns about safety. I, my feeling, and I'd be straight, would be that, yeah, might change the way, you might not be able to send every kid to every corner of the building to do individual projects. You might have to have some work together and stuff. But do I think it's doable? Yeah, I do. All right. Um, in the Woods class, you know, I just wouldn't recommend that would come back. But in as a result of that, because you do have bumping with tenure and stuff, Mike is the one that gets hit. He loses really a, one class both semesters the way it is right now. And that comes down to about, um, I think it is, got to find it, a, a point. 8.2 FTE. Full time now, I'd drop them down to about an 8.2 FTE. It would save the district about $11,436. All right, but that would be the saving. And then I gave you some numbers. Certainly, the smaller, and, and I gave, put those numbers in there just to remind the board that the smaller the class size, the more per student that class will cost the district. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't offer it, but there is always a cost that is associated with that. Class sizes are wonderful to have small ones, but we're, when, we're, when we look at our budget, we're going to have to de make some hard decisions about what is too small before you don't offer it. I wish we could offer everything to every student. But if you do that, you will be going back for a referendum very quickly. All right? So that's an option. Now, one option for that would be to add back, I'm not going to recommend adding back the, the, the woods. I think we're fine on that, but we could add back the lands transfer this year, and see all numbers are going. They do tend to have those numbers go higher as the year goes. Kids say, well, I can't get that, so but now I want to go to lands trans. So that would be one more reason to look at that. Even with that, we're still predicting we'd be less than 15 in a class, but you don't know that. So that would be one option. It would save us half of that. You know, it costs us about 6446 bucks to come back with one semester. But that is certainly an option, and it also eases the transition as we look at changes. It would be kind of a, a midpoint. All right, so that, that's a possibility. And if I could add, yep. Land Trans is one of the programs that Painesville is unique to other schools in our area. Uh, many of the, our neighboring school districts do not have a Land Trans program, nor is the, the program as intricate as ours is. So it is something that is unique to, it, to it, Painesville. Yep, you explain it. It's a wonderful program. Thank you. Land Trans is our automotive program, and Mike has done a phenomenal job through the years keeping all our equipment updated. And right now we have three uh, full car lifts, and I don't know of a school in the area that have the same thing. Um, you know, he's always wanted to engage in the paint piece, and that that won't happen at the high school level. <laughs> but um, hey, I saw a car those guys built. Oh, I know, and I, we we have a mutant. Uh, sidekick that they put a, uh, a six or eight inch lift kit in last year and did some other things. But it is a very unique program and I know it does draw kids from other districts. So when, when you're looking at a poll for some of our CTE uh, students, we have several kids going on to ALEC and other areas where that is what they're going into their two year program. Um, in mechanics, if it's airplanes or cars or, or semi-automatic, so it's like, you know it's it's hard. At the same time, I think bringing back one of the two sections would be very good because it could hold on to some of that where kids are able to do more intricate projects, etc. At the same time, I don't believe we have the numbers to say to bring back both sections or in, in that regard either. So. Yes. 
And again, I want everybody to understand that all of these are good programs. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not in any way saying none of these programs. I would hope that we don't have any programs that we don't think are beneficial to students. You know, they should have gone a long time ago. So in, in, when I was at the prom, the, the car parade at the prom, I mean, Mike pointed out a, a, a car they virtually built from nothing. You know, so to say that they do a great job is, is certainly accurate on that. But I will just continue to remind the board that sooner or later, some of these, as the budgets get tighter and tighter, we are going to have to look at these numbers. Because we do offer the program. We're not cutting the program. We're still offering it. The number of sections is where I'm saying we, we have to look at it. Okay, any questions with the last trans piece? Okay, let's go on to the computer applications. This is where it really affects another one of our staff members, and it, it's really, again, because of bumping. As you go and offer other sections, the bumping and tenured piece starts working its way down. In this case, the, the, you know, the piece ends, ends with um, really cuts to Diane's work, all right? And it really would be a 0.33 reduction for her. Uh, there, are, there are no classes there, and again, I want to emphasize this. There are no classes there I don't think are worthwhile. They just didn't get the numbers that we need in order to offer those classes. It would, does save the district a, a $23,160 amount. One other option, and she came up with a really unique thing. I, I was really impressed. One of the things that happens when we have smaller classes is that they're real small numbers, but so we can't offer the course. What she's looked at doing is having a number for a small offerings in one class. It would be a lot of work for her, and I wouldn't envy that if we do that, but for a semester, one option might be for us to give that a try. To see if we get enough kids entered into that class, which would be made up of a few classes, to come up and, and offer one more section. It, it would take her from, right now I think we we're looking at a, a .67. Um, it would bring uh, bring her back up to the, uh, that. I don't think I put that number there. I, wonder if it, I have it on the sheet. Just hold on. Um, well, she started at a point five. She moved to a point six six for a, a few years, and then this is the first year that she's gone full time. But it would add back some of that. Now it'd be about an eight thousand dollar cost to the district if we would do that out of the twenty three. But that would not be an option. It would help ease things a little bit. And she really was thinking outside the box when she was looking that way. The other piece is, is that if we go down where she was at, the health piece is also a piece that does get hit by moving another one in there, it takes care of that. And that's part of the reason that it's, it's a high cost to us. But it certainly would help in this, this particular situation. So it was certainly on my recommendation, or at least my list of things that we could look at at bringing back. I, I can't go any more than that, um, but I, I think to go that far would certainly make some sense. Uh, and the other piece that happened is that originally, Ricori was going to use one of our other teachers. They were going through their own budget cuts, and that also hit us again, which caused more to happen than we thought would, because they reduced, they don't need our staff member as much as they thought. So our staff member would, comes back in, and then the whole thing comes up again. So it was really a number of factors that are doing that. But that's um, one other issue or piece that we're, look, we were, we're looking at. Any questions on that? Um, the macro was the other piece. Um, there were nine students in it that are enrolled, two are seniors. It is a course that is offered every other year. Now, it's a great course by a great instructor. That, again, isn't the issue. My feeling is, is that we, you know, it's been offered every year, and sometimes I'm assuming, although I didn't go back and look, I think last year I had good numbers. This year, we don't have the numbers. And when that happens, I'm really gonna tell the board, this is a class that we could offer every other year and meet the needs. Now, the concern certainly is that, will kids go some other place if we don't offer it? I can't speak for that, I don't know. My guess would be it would have, maybe not have that, but I, I, I can't tell you that for sure. And again, it's not that it's not a great course, it is. But it is a course that I think we need to, to look at at least going every other year if we're going to stay around that number of students who enroll it. All right? Now, there's, and on top of that, when talking with Lori, 
this also has a, 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 the, the impact of mo moving down. Um, and where this ends up is that the instructor that would teach the macro, at least right now, would have to go down into the elementary and teach a, a, a section of it for, well, what my recommendation would be a half a year. Because Lori also needs help in world language. And if we're going to add some, or world history, sorry, I've been saying world language all the time, world history, thanks, Lori. Um, in, in world history, because of the numbers, I would want to offer a semester of that back before I would want to offer the, the macro. And that will reduce the bumping things to a year or a, a semester of one class down in the elementary. On top of it all, that particular person down in the elementary is going to get some adaptive time. So I think that, that the FTE will actually go up a little bit for that person, not down. So when we look at on, on request of leave, it probably won't affect that person. That person will probably have as much as he has right now or a little more. All right? But again, it, it's one of those decisions that we've got to make in order, for, from my point of view, to get things in alignment with our, our budget right now. I wish we didn't have to talk about any of these things. The other piece is, any questions on the macro? Otherwise, is we're going to... Is yep. it possible for um, these two seniors who will be home? Lori is looking to see if there's any online courses that, that she could do. Question. Yep. Um, I have, it is one that when we started it, advanced psych and a macro, we're going to alternate and it is in the curriculum guide. Is that, now this is actually the first year that that will come into play because of numbers. We've always had more than 15, you know, so, so that part is hard. Um, I have found one online um, program that is a college course is through the University of Minnesota. It's not through our Infinity doesn't offer it, but it's through another program, um, which it would, could be open to those two seniors if they would so choose. They may also, through just course selection, decide to take the advanced site also. Um, we're kind of waiting for, for the class schedule to kind of define itself a little more so we can start scheduling. But we'll work with, you know, especially our seniors, and that's when the world history piece, looking at the number of students, we certainly can fill, you know, 20 to 25 kids in three sections versus two sections of world history. And to make those singleton classes like advanced psych and calculus of work for kids, that is why I would say that the third world history class is it would make a world of difference in scheduling our juniors and seniors into the courses they want. Um, because when you get so many singletons, it's hard for them to get those required ones in. So the bang for the buck, and I did have Jackie go through probably a third of all the classes um, in the scheduling, and she came up with the world history is what we need. And, and one of the things the board needs to recognize is that when you don't offer a course because the moment those kids go some other place, and they make a number of the other courses more viable because their enrollment goes up, if that makes sense. Uh, any question? Any other questions on that? Um, <coughs> uh, the six period classes, we're going to, we won't do four. Um, I didn't realize that two of the ones that I was looking at were semester courses that really equals one. There is a savings of over $5,000 per one of those. We are going to reduce possibly three of those. In the end, you know, uh, haven't exactly decided. It doesn't affect the FTE of that person. It is an additional amount of dollars that goes to the staff member if they teach a sixth class. Um, but it, but those, they're still full time. The only class that I would recommend that we would look at changing possibly is sixth grade math. Um, I think their numbers will be at 2530 if we don't add another section, and that is an area that six, when they make the adjustment you know, from the elementary up to sixth grade, that could be a difficult time as they do that, and I'm not sure, at least at this point, we're gonna do that, but either way, whether it's two or three, you're certainly gonna look at a, at least a $10,000 savings there. And then I just gave some other facts about why we're not adding some particular things. Um, the art pieces would be nice if we could offer those, I just don't think we can afford to. They are all six period classes, though. And if you look down at Design 2, for instance, it, it just talks about 39 students registered, 25 will get the course, and of course we're going to go with the upperclassmen first, so it's really the underclassmen that wouldn't necessarily get the course, but it does leave 14 kids on that can't get that particular course. Now you could say, well, let's add another section. If you do that, it's going to cost the district, you know, $2,500 to do that, because it's a semester course, I think, Lori? Correct. 
So, it, you know, you just have to understand that my stance would be, yeah, we're going to continue to offer this. Those kids will eventually get the opportunity to do that. And I think, you know, we don't, we just simply don't need to offer the course this year. And we do think it's beneficial for the kids to take a range of different electives. So even though they may really want to take art because they see some of the different artwork, things like personal finance or accounting, some of those other electives I think are very good um, courses for them to take and it, they just may not necessarily realize it yet because it's not what they're drawn to immediately when looking through the curriculum guide. So it would be one way for us to help lead them down a path of getting a, a, you know, a good balanced education. Now, in the, in the one last thing, and I'll try to get through the rest fairly quickly. Um, for the macro piece, you have to understand it's not a great savings. For if we add the world history one, it'll be about uh, you know $1,600 savings because we bump. Remember, we bump to the lowest person who doesn't make the most amount of money, but it's still savings. Um, so then it just kind of goes through and has some information. Any, I don't want to read it for you. It's kind of self-explanatory on why we're doing what we're doing, and it tells you how many kids are getting in, how many kids aren't, and they're all, I believe, they're most of them are sixth grade type of classes. All right. So if you look at the elementary, you know, you've got the savings of the teacher, you've got the savings of the parent, we go that way, and just you look back at those sheets, and I think I gave you a summary, or you know, at least it discusses how much we would do all of those pieces if we go that way. On top of it all, for the, the secondary, there's a teacher who retired, um, or really two teachers. One of them won't save us anything um, by retiring because it's, we need a master's to come back. So if you need a master's, you're not going to get the same savings as you will if you bring in a younger person. The other one you will save, um, you can save up to, I think, for, for like 47000 is one of the savings. And I think I've got that stuff listed out for you. So that kind of fills you in, and I know it's a lot of information. It can make your head spin. Uh, I'll, you'll certainly have a final recommendation for me, um, from my point of view anyway, at the next board meeting. Particularly for, you'll have two things. You'll have a list of kind of reductions that I'll bring to the board and say, these are things that I'd like you to approve. So we approve those first, and then for the people who may be affected by unrequested leave, then we have to do a motion for probably both those people if that's the way we're at. And at that point, I mean, you can either send me any questions that you have, um, or you can wait till the board meeting. We can have the discussion. Either way, I, in order to do it, I will have to have a motion and an approval so that our timelines can be can be kept and that are necessary. Other questions that you have? I know it's just a this ton of information. This doesn't include the hundred that you just told us about earlier. Oh, no. No, that's so, an addition. To, well, so that's a that subtraction gonna, from our budget, yeah. Is that going to kind of have to work, rework? Well, but, but I, you know, no, I, I think, you know, again, it, it's the difficulty of looking at what our students need and also our staff. I'm going to try to find, at least for this year, a midpoint if I can. In future years, you may hear me flat out say we can't afford even a midpoint. I can't. We can't afford to add anything back. You know, we're going to be okay for well. We do have a new referendum. It does. There are benefits. If no matter what we add back to our students, there are. You know, class, smaller class sizes is, is an absolute benefit to students. Af offering more courses is an af absolute benefit to students. But as the budget shakes out, we may need to make harder decisions. You know, my intent this year was not to just come in and just start, you know, doing everything. My intent is to start working towards having a balanced budget where we're not deficit spending. You can't afford to unless we have a good solid reserve fund. We can't. You know, if you had a million two in there like you did at one point, we wouldn't be talking about any of these things. We'd probably be offering things that had smaller class sizes. But not having that, we have to get that deficit spending under control or we will quickly not be going back to the, the community and our goal should be to postpone that until, you know, until this referendum is, my perfect scenario would be, don't worry about it until the next, the referendum <coughs> the one's done. But to do that, we've got to get control of this budget, so we're going to have to make it. I would just prefer not to go down the road of coming in and just 
axing everything until we get a better feel on where we're going and how the referendum will help us. So you may not hear me, but I mean, you may hear me say, yep, I know it's going to cost us, but let's not make this cut this year. Let's look at it for next year because I, I think we have to look at both sides of all sides of this coin as we're doing this. I had not planned, and I told Lori and, and Dave that I had not planned on going into the, the, the building budgets. I hope to give them some stability for at least a year, because they've been cutting. With this hundred thousand dollars, I've got to relook at that to see where we're at. Any other questions for this? I, like I said, that's a lot of information. And truly, if this if this is not as much depth as the board wants to go in, we don't have to go this much in depth. So I'd like input from the board concerning this when you get a chance. I have one more question. Yep. Um, you were cutting the earth and space. You, yep. You had 12. I, I think what we thought on that well, one, we, we explain that one, Lori. You had eight enrolled, but you were cutting the earth and space. Yeah. Um, what we looked at is looking at kind of that number 15 as a primary number, okay? With knowing that uh, chemistry for for that third year, chem or third year of science, with our sophomores right now moving into juniors, they have to have a chemistry that we feel that, you know, those numbers, once they actually start registering, would probably be less. And if I have to choose between different science courses, that a consumer chemistry, a, a chemistry that's more hands-on, not that college-based chemistry is going to be more beneficial for our students and that those juniors do need to take that. So that earth and space would pro will probably be one that goes into that every other year, going back and forth between earth and space and field bio. Definitely a very good course, but I think we need to look at it as an alternating science course that we're going to so offer. So it's more than just the numbers that you're looking right. at. Right. You know, looking at because this is really the first year that our juniors move forward and they have to look at electives and they have to look at those requirement pieces as well. And this is the first year that they have to take a chemistry course. So I think we need to kind of see where that population is at. So my, my plan, no, seeing how numbers kind of laid out, is to look at that field bio which had more numbers and I think those kids that were signed up for Earth and Space will probably go into taxidermy or field bio because they like the sciences, maybe um, the animal science as well, uh, and then look at that alternating piece. So we're still offering it, but it would be on the alternating year. So, and when I looked, I, I happen to have, I can find it here. Um, I was just gonna see my junior, senior, I think was a, piece of that too as far as how many juniors and seniors. Earth and Space had five juniors, seven seniors. Yeah, so it was one of those, it's hard when you're starting to look at those numbers um, and then licensures also of the staff. But that was a call that I think as far as when the kids are going to take it and what they're going to take, so. Yeah, and it, and it's an excellent point about the new requirements for science. That chemistry. Un unfortunately, that does have an impact on our electives because they've got to take another course which pulls them out of another elective course. Does biobiology qualify as a chemistry course? No. no. It doesn't have all the chemistry standards in it and your chemistry course has to. It, it doesn't even fit the standard for the biology course in itself because it doesn't contain all the biology standards. It's a biology and it's a science. So when the standard was they had to have three years of science, one had to be a physical science, one had to be a biology, and they had the third year open. Then they could take like field biology as one semester of that and animal science. Now they say that third year has to be a chemistry and it has to include the chemistry standards. So the field biology does not. And, and the curriculum doesn't incorporate it. It does some, a, a little bit of it, but not in completion. So at some point, would they be better off adding another chemistry class? Well, and that's what I did at that consumer chemistry. That's what took place of that earth and space, so that you have a, a second track for this, the students coming up. You're going to have some that are going to fit really well into that college-based chemistry, 
and then you are going to have some that, you know, that's not their thing. You know, they're not looking at engineering and math and science as their college focus, um, that you need a different track of chemistry to provide that curriculum. So that was the trade-off is looking at that consumer chem and one of those other science electives. You know, or we'd be adding another semester of science and I didn't feel that was what we needed, what we should be doing. So that was the trade-off. Okay. And again, if this is too much detail for you, if you, don't, if you just want the numbers, I can do that and make this a lot shorter. So just give me some input from your perspective on what the board's desire is as far as in depth or just kind of the nitty gritty of it all. All right, that's what I have. Okay. Uh, moving on, number one, personnel. We're doing consider approval of the following athletic assignment for the 13 14 school year. <coughs> adversity, boys basketball coach hiring, not uh, Jacob Heimer. I think from my perspective, I think um, he was a unanimous pick by the, the committee that that did the interview and everything. I, I think the only piece that I have at all is if, if the board approves this, then it creates another hole in, in, in our girls basketball team. So we would, it's just, it is one of those things. At the same time, certainly um, he, he wanted to try for it and he was the unanimous pick of the committee to offer the position to. So unless there's any questions on the board or I think that's on Max to step out uh, to the runway, but any other questions? priority of, of my schedule right now is trying to get our juniors and seniors scheduled because like we like to do individual meetings with them to look at where they are credit wise etc for the upcoming year uh, the other thing that the staff and I are talking about right now is and I'll be bringing it probably in June to our meeting is uh, kind of a revised uh, time schedule for for our classes which would involve um, starting the student's day about five minutes earlier and ending the student day about five minutes later. Keeping, you know, cognizant of we have sports after school, so you don't want to, you know, go too much into that time as well as the whole busing piece and getting kids up too early. We think we can make things work for keeping that advisor time and um, giving back some of the time taken from the classes. So. Uh, we're still kind of hashing that out uh, at the faculty level um, and then kind of recouping from prom which Diane Fortney right up there I think she deserves a, a hand as well as our parent group which works behind the scenes I don't know if the board realizes our after prom uh, committee puts together the whole after prom party as well um, Diane Fortney is the school supervisor for the prom, which is the Grand March and the dinner and the dance. The after prom committee does uh, the after prom party for the kids and it all went off without a hitch. It was a very good night for the students and I'm hearing very positive things um, from the kids. A little tired. <laughs> um, everybody was a little tired on Sunday. Um, but that went very well and then we're looking ahead to baccalaureate, graduation, final diploma checks, all of those things. So it's a busy <coughs> month over here at the high school. Middle school, um, we are going to be looking at putting out um, the advertisements to fill those summer positions that you okay me to move forward with the last board meeting. So, and we'll be interviewing for our English position tomorrow. So, um, and hopefully we'll find some applicants from that. Okay. Any questions that you might have? And certainly if you have questions individually on the schedule, feel free to give me a call as well. Um, Bob and I have spent quite a few hours with it. Um, if you have questions, give me a call. Okay, thanks, Lori. Uh, Dave. 
All right, well, um, just finishing up our end of the year activities with field trips and, and things like that. We have our Bulldog Field Day on Friday. Today we had uh, the FFA students come over and had our Ag Day, and uh, so we appreciate that. And uh, we're finishing up our MCAs. We'll finish up with science next week. And uh, next week on May 15th, we're sending 30 students, uh, grades three through five, to a, a young author, young artist conference at St. Ben's. And this is the second year that we've, we've done that. It gives uh, some of our uh, <coughs> level students an opportunity to, to uh, showcase some of their talents and do some exploring. So Cheryl Colbert um, is in charge of that, actually, and she takes them. Any questions for me at all? Okay. Uh, Matt. Okay. Um, this is hot off the press. You should have all received one in your mailbox, but this is the first year we mailed our summer brochure um, with the addition of the Painesville Area Center with uh, our partners. Uh, we have quite a few uh, new programs and activities in there. Um, won't highlight them due to time, but um, if you have questions on any of the things, um, feel free to give me a call or an email. Uh, if you get an email from me today or tomorrow, we have episode 12 of our BNC TV. Uh, we just finished editing today. That'll be all, uh, that's on our YouTube channel today. So um, the cold, wet weather um, really helped our fitness center memberships this year. Uh, we had the, the best spring that we've had, um, and it really made up for a lot of um, uh, visits, so we're, we're on track for a really record year. So, any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Max stepped out. He said he had to step out to get the uh, baseball game started. Yep. Way, so. Okay. Uh, Billy, you are outside. We were able to uh, shut the boilers off on Monday. Hope <laughs> we don't have to turn them on again. That's probably about a month later than last year. Oh, not more. Uh, our supplies are coming in for summer work tomorrow, which is great, but we're going to be a week short this year because of the snow days on uh, getting our job, our work done. Uh, things we hope to accomplish this summer would be uh, retrofitting another 100 lockers, uh, putting LED lights in the fitness or in the auditorium, chemical feeders on the boilers, and replacing a few bad tubes in boiler number one, patching holes in the parking lot, and replacing some carpet, carpet with floor tile. Things we should look at in the future, I was just adding up numbers the other day, and there's about 125,000 square feet of roof that is over 20, or 20 years old or right now. And our parking lots have not been re sealed or seal coated since 2007, so that's something we'll have to look at. And actually, oh yeah, that, well, that was brought up at the next board meeting, uh, Joe Cernia from Newell Company. Extremely happy to say I have no snow days to bring to you this time. <laughs> We're finally going with, with the spring sports and everything seems to be running. Uh, uh, we're working on the tentative calendar for next year, at least at one point I thought I had it taken care of and then I ran into a glitch that we're trying to work out so I need to step away and, and do a little bit of the process again as far as we can confer with the teacher and I'm in the process of doing that now. Uh, I'll be coming back hopefully even maybe next meeting or at the very least the next one with that calendar for, for the board. Well, also my intent still is to come up with a tentative 14-15 calendar that we won't bring to the board for approval because then every time something comes up in the future, I'd have to rechange it, but at least it would give parents and the board an idea of what, to, what it would look like two years down the road instead of one. So doing that, uh, continue to work on the budget as you know, we certainly had discussions on that. Um, can, health insurance continues to be a concern. We're still not sure how that's going to affect this district. Um, we still have more questions than we when we have solid answers. The, the pieces that we're looking at right now, they're telling me, well, I think this will be the way it is. 
that bothers me a little bit when they say I think this is the way it's going to be because if it's not the way they're telling me then it could have a significant financial impact on us so we're still trying to figure that one out enrollment good news it kind of continue to stay constant which is good um, and graduation will be quickly upon us uh, the capital budget that Donnie referred to I know that board members are a part of that I'm going to try to set up another meeting for next week Wednesday if I can I'll get you something out I'd like to do it during the day so it doesn't affect some people more than others but I'll send an email out on that just give you some times and see if it'll work but it, it's a problem we have a lot of things that we need to get done with our capital budget we don't have the dollars in our capital budget to get them done so we're going to have to cut unfortunately I think what it's, it's going to mean to me is that we won't be able to keep in our reserve fund what I was had hoped to keep I hope to keep two hundred thousand dollars in there I, in order to get some things done I just don't think we can keep it in there which just holds us at risk of things happening. I mean, just a simple man when it had the accident. I mean, it was a $25,000 piece we didn't expect. So money can be spent really quickly. Um, that would be it. Okay. Anything else? Um, I just have uh, just an observation now since the girls are playing volleyball or softball a lot. I thought at one time we were going to try to close off that Janata Road a little bit. It was closed. Yeah, it was closed off last night. Yep, yeah, it seems like there's a lot of games that I've been over there that they're. Boy, any, over. any game that I've been at for softball right now, that road has been closed. For high school or for? For the high school. For, for high only school. high school. Because I know that seventh and eighth grade does not. Yeah, no, yeah, I can't speak for that because I've been to the J or the JV game. I think in the varsity. And I think all it is is they. The, they just pulled that, they just just pulled pulled that over, so maybe I can have Max just mention that to maybe. the middle school coaches. Maybe they don't realize it's probably because you just hook it and yep. unhook it. Oh, I know that we have there. That's right. And yeah. I, my daughter's not that old, so I don't yeah. think it's first. So, um, there's yeah. no reason we can look at it. And okay. this, yeah, they've been fine with us doing it that yep. way. So, we'll just I know it's a big it. safety thing. I know yeah. the we'll mention it to the middle school coaches. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay, anything else? Mm -hmm. Not being journey. Nice to make a couple of kids on this.